Oh, please. Socks? Hello? Yeah, your socks are doing crazy things. I got a sweater. Looks just like that. You want these socks when we're done with the shoot today? Get them back to the rightful owner. The family reunited. <laughs> sweater! <laughs> Socksy! Oh, you brought... You brought your brother! <laughs> sweater and Socksy. Yep. Right now, up in, up in my closet, sweater's like, I sense... I sense them. They're, they're, near, they're somewhere near. You have to get up... Off the hanger. Do you, do you hang your sweaters? No. No? Okay. You said in your closet, so... Fold them and stack them. I fold them and then just cram them into the drawer. We don't have fancy closets with shelves in them in our house. Because <laughs> we have a baby. We had a shelf in that closet, but we had to put the baby in the closet. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. It's been such a long time since we've watched a good old-fashioned western. Oh. Tonight, we bear witness to the Oxbow Incident. Ah, oh, howdy! <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's all right. Released in 1943, directed by basement alum William Wellman, T.O.B.I. stars Henry Fonda, Dana Andrews, and Anthony Quinn. It was adapted from the novel of the same name by Walter Van Tilburg Clark. Walter Van Tilburg Clark, yes, I work in westerns. The film was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture at the 16th Annual Academy Awards, losing to Casablanca. How could... Who chose that movie? The Oscars are broken. <laughs> Since 1943, it has been the only film nominated for Best Picture and nothing else. In 1998, the film was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress. It's good. We can throw this out when we're done with it, because they have it in the big library. Yeah, they got it. At that time, the Oxbow Valley setting was the largest... Uh, that's a first. Cecil. Shame on you. The Oxbow Valley setting was the largest set ever constructed by Fox, covering 26,703 square feet. I have no idea how that would be, how big that is. I don't know space. Yeah? I can't... I can't wrap my head around measurements mm -hmm. and things like that. It's just not not my brain. I watched this, like, two years ago. Oh, okay, so I recently. For, I, filling in my Western gaps, as I sometimes say. Western gaps. Yes. I'm not that big of a Henry Fonda fan or William Wellman fan. <laughs> if you're a cowpoke out riding the range, there's two things you need. A place to store your vittles and a little something to remind you that gal you got waiting back at the homestead for you. This gift does both. Oh, look at this. It's a lunchbox. With pretty ladies that in it. That is a pretty lady. This reminds me of my wife. <laughs> or does it? Hello. <laughs> Maybe I'll be staying out late on the range tonight. Just me and the lunchbox. <laughs> Jump on your horse and shout giddy up as you ride on over to the old leather couch for the Oxbow Incident. <laughs> Harry Davenport, or as we now call him, Harry Couch. <laughs> Nevada, 1885. Gill and Bart show up in town. And they go right for the saloon. I'll have a vodka Red Bull. My friend will have one too. Well, what's on your boy's mind? Something have to be on my mind. Well, there's mud in your eye. There's mud on my mind. And in my eye. I'm just uh, It's all mud. <laughs> Gill's real ornery because he came back to see his girl, Rose, she skipped town with some other guy. It's my guess the married women run around. Not that she ever did anything. My. But going to third base? <laughs> Wait a minute. Baseball's a new invention. Same Fourth word. base she goes to. <laughs> That's just great. He doesn't think it's great at all. That's called acting. You say something, <laughs> but you make it sound like something else. You can take a joke, can't you? Sure, I can take a joke. Mostly I stick to your mama jokes, but I can take other jokes as well. Hey, it wouldn't be that wrestling folks we're talking about last fall. Wrestling folks? They're coming through town? The Crusher. King Kong Bundy. <laughs> we're old. <laughs> there are a lot of things around here ain't clear. One thing that's not clear is whether or not I am Dana Andrews. He's not. <laughs> okay. He gets into a scrap right off with just some guy who walks into a bar and looks at him funny. <laughs> Whoa! News comes into town. Larry Kincaid, cattle man has been shot and his cattle have been rustled. Two worst things he can do in the Old West. They start to form a posse. Jeff Farnley has a very close relationship with Kincaid and he wants to see whoever it is dead. But this man says, no, we have to go see Judge Tyler first. Don't let's go off half-cocked and do something we'll be sorry for. 
We want to act in a reasoned and legitimate manner. With full cockedness. Uh, we don't need Judge Tyler. Down in Texas, where I come from, we just... Texas, Texas, whenever you meet a Texan, that's all I can talk about. <laughs> Larry Kincaid, one of the finest, most God-fearing men that ever lived, is lying out there right now with a bullet hole in his head. Finally getting to know if this God person should have been feared or not. Bring your ropes, bring your guns, we're gonna have a good time tonight. Lord loves a hanging, that's yeah. why he give us next. We can't form this posse anyway because the sheriff isn't even in town. It doesn't matter because he deputized Butch Mapes. If he goes on this posse, they're definitely going to hang those guys and not give them a fair trial. Meanwhile, Major Tetley is at his home and his son is there and he says, I don't like you as a son. I wish you turned out to be more of a man. Do is I that say? Dana Andrews? Do do. Gil goes to see Judge Tyler. Well... Yes! <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> he says, come in. And your little friend, too. Judge, you gotta come out and deal with this situation. Mapes is there. There's a posse forming, Judge, in case you hadn't heard. Don't worry. I'm gonna deputize them all proper. Risley's the only one empowered to deputize. That's right, RISD. The finest school of design in the entire country. They can only deputize. Some people say, no, we got to bring him in for a fair trial because that's how America works. Then lawyers will be involved in judges. The only justice can be done is frontier justice. This goonie guy keeps making hanging faces. He really wants to hang someone. He does. You watch the movie. And then make way for a lady. Ma shows up. She's an old cattle baron herself. Oh, you better come on, Sparks. Come on, Sparks. Don't just sit here in town and make bizarre pop music. Reverend Sparks comes along, too, because they'll be needing someone to pray. Sheriff Risley's already down at Kincaid. Sheriff Risley is supposed to be in Rhode Island where his school of design is, but he's here instead. Then Major Tedley gets all gussied up in his old Civil War outfit. He was fighting for the wrong side. I'm gonna lead this posse. You're coming with me, son. I'm gonna make a man out of you. Finally, Mapes deputizes the posse and they ride out. There's a ruckus and some shooting when a speeding stagecoach comes through. Bart gets a shot in the shoulder. The most convenient place to be shot on the human body. In the movies, at least. Stepping out of that stagecoach. Rose Mapen. You slut. Gil's old girlfriend. And Mr. Swanson, a dude. Gil's old girlfriend's wife. Husband. <laughs> Dana Andrews? Nope. Hello, everybody. I'm newly married. <laughs> Boy, right now I'm hungry for some rhubarb and some bread and butter. Peas and carrots? Oh, yes, all of it. People attend to Bart, who's been injured. Here I'm good at this sort of thing. I've just decided. <laughs> Turns out I'm not. Did you say shot? I thought you said shit himself. <laughs> <laughs> Gil and Rose have some brief words. Gil and Swanson have some less brief words. I know you used to be friends with her, kind of like how I'm friends with her in a legal capacity right now. We're not friends, friend. The stagecoach rides away. It's cold. But I'm telling you, this rope's going to have to be thawed out before it's fit to use. Even the rope's cold. <laughs> the posse reaches the oxbow area. Before anyone can do anything, an ox pops out from behind a bush. <laughs> and they hear the rustled cattle. Looks like an incident's gonna happen. They sneak in. The horses are walking on tip hoof. It's the thieves and murderers. Three men sleeping by a fire. Dana Andrews. You happy now? <laughs> get up! Dana Andrews. They easily get the jump on him. <sighs> I just shat myself. And take their guns. Take it easy, mister. It's Mr. Andrews, Dana Andrews. Why we didn't do anything, says Donald Martin. Well, it's funny you say you didn't do anything because you're about to get hung. I've been working on that bit. And I advise you to control your tongue, too. We'll get along better. They've got Kincaid's cattle. Martin says, I bought these from Kincaid. Have you a bill of sale for those cattle? Well, no, I haven't. The bill of sale, or lack thereof, is a huge issue in this incident. He was out on the range. He didn't have a bill of sale with him. He said he'd mail it to me. He must be guilty. Take him back to the judge like Davies wants. This is only slightly any of your business, my friend. Remember that? Hanging's any man's business that's around. Because the old man is a doddering, baffle-minded man. And Juan Martinez, who doesn't speak English. Or so he says. The Mexican did it. He's the one who... <sighs> the Mexican did it. The old man's feeble-minded. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He invents things. 
You hear the typewriter? That's him. <laughs> his name's not Martinez. His name is Francisco Juarez. He's a gambler and he's wanted for murder. More proof. They're getting ready for the hanging. At least let me write a letter to my wife. That ain't asking much, Tetley. With your permission, gentlemen, we'll wait till daylight. Don't give him a pen. It's mightier than a sword. The posse didn't have time to pack a lunch, but luckily the three fugitives have plenty of food on them, and so our pest is cooked up. Are those two getting busy? You know, how they used to back then. Like this. <laughs> now I'm gonna have a baby. <laughs> Martinez makes a run for it. He's trying to vaminos. They chase after him, shoot him in the leg, and bring him back. Turns out he does speak English. And ten other languages, my dear. He takes the bullet out of his own leg because that's how much of a badass Martinez is. Ah, 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 that's how you get the bullet out! <laughs> ha ha! <laughs> and he's got Kincaid's gun. Now where'd you get that gun? Found it? Where? Lying on the road. These guys can't catch a break. The old fellow reads the letter. He's not capable of doing these things if he wrote this letter. Come on, Fonda. Twelve angry men, this. It appears as though the posse isn't in unanimous agreement about this whole lynching thing. Everybody who's with Mr. Davies are putting this thing off and turning it over to the courts. Step over there. And one by one, the men cross over. This guy just followed by heavenly choirs. <laughs> the old white-haired gentleman whose name I don't remember. Gil and Bart and Major Tetley's son. Vote for yourself. Vote for yourself, <laughs> Dana Andrews. We'll have to settle this with a dance-off. They're not a majority, not even close, so the hanging will happen. Dawn arrives. It's me, God. Let them go. I'd like to make a confession. I confess to being devilishly handsome. Like, really? Look at everyone in this room. Dana over here, very handsome man. But me can't beat this. The men are placed on the horses. Finally, you, Gabe Hart. And Jello will whip the horses out. The rest of you spread out and make good use of the square footage. My son will do it because my son is not a man yet. The kid's seen enough already. Why don't you let him alone? I think Henry Fonda says that in every movie he's in. Let him alone! It's his I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> the three men are hung. And then to finish the job, Farnley shoots them all. I didn't, really didn't know how this was going to end. <laughs> I, thought, I thought they were going to get out of it at the last minute. Everyone gets on their horses and rides away. They are stopped by the sheriff. What's all that shooting about? Kincaid's murderers have been taken care of. Larry Kincaid's not dead. He faked his own death for insurance <laughs> fraud. He told us who shot him. And it's not one of those three people, you bozos. So who's responsible for this? And the old white-haired gentleman says, all of them but seven. God better have mercy on you. You won't get any from me. Everyone heads home in awkward silence. You ask me, that Tepe's the one we ought to lynch. <laughs> Major Tetley goes back to his mansion. And he locks the door on his own son. But his son tells him off. I saw your face. It was the face of a depraved, murderous beast. Major Tetley goes into the next room and shoots himself. Although maybe he just shot Margaret Hamilton. We don't know. It's inconclusive. <laughs> They're all sitting in the saloon. Every man alone with his whiskey and his thoughts. And you ought to read this letter, too. You know I can't read. What I'm saying is you ought to learn to read. That's my nice way of saying it. If you buy <coughs> something and they give you a bill of sale, you won't be able to read it, and then you'll get hung. Everyone knows what they did wrong. They'll have to go on remembering for the rest of their lives. They're going to go deliver that letter themselves to Martin's widow and try to forget the incident that happened at the Ox's Bow. It's a short horse ride. It's only 26,000 square feet from here. <laughs> Hangins any man's business who's around. The Oxbow Incident. This is a fine cautionary tale about mob mentality. Mm -hmm. The warning of the movie is that justice is slow and revenge is fast. We're not bringing them in because there'll be a trial and then we'll have to think about it. Well, what it comes down to is that they wanted to kill. Mm -hmm. yeah. For various reasons. Yeah. You know, Mr. Goofus with his funny faces, just because it's fun. The Major, to prove a point. The other guy, for just straight out revenge. And also, yeah, something to liven up their boring little town. And that's even more sinister, just the fact that it's something to do. And, and who cares who we do it to, really? 
violence even shows up at the very beginning of the movie with Gil, who is supposed to be the good man in the story. Oh, he gets yeah. into a fight because he needs to. I think one of the hallmarks of a great actor is having a great voice. I figured out the thing I liked the least about Henry Fonda. It's his voice. Yeah, that kind of very western. Very flat. The sheriff didn't even know we were coming. He's an excellent actor. Yeah, and he listens really well, and you can always see him thinking, which makes all of his characters vibrant. This movie took great pains to include women somehow. The old girlfriend just appears out of nowhere yeah. for no reason. That scene has nothing to do with anything. It's a good scene. It's just like it's really awkwardly shoved into the movie. And it really doesn't affect Gil at all. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect a decision that he makes later on. It does seem very odd that they would cast both Ma Jode and Tom Jode and then keep playing Red River Valley, which was the theme of Grapes of Wrath. That's a song you hear and it just conjures this wistful feeling about mm -hmm. the open spaces of the plains of yeah. the West. The Red River, if I recall my geography correctly, has a lot of oxbows in it. What is an oxbow? A turn in a river or a series of turns in a river which kind of makes uh, S shapes. Like, the uh, yoke of like an a oxen. yoke of an ox, okay. yes. Okay. It denotes a kind of a dead end, that there's not going to be an escape. And it's also kind of a noose-shaped. Great title. It would be an apt title for a police procedural. Yeah, it's almost a clinical title. Yeah. To call it the Oxbow Tragedy, mm -hmm. or the Oxbow Miscarriage of Justice, is yeah. putting too fine a point on it. It also gives away the ending. Which I didn't see coming. No, how was that for you? I thought the sheriff was going to come riding up at the last minute. I'd heard it was bleak, so I kind of suspected it was going to mm -hmm. happen, but... Nice work with light here. Mm -hmm. We see the shadows of the hangmen, the morning sun coming in. It's beautiful. I think the movie took too long to get going. There was that long scene in the town. And I understand that they really had to sell the moral ambiguity. And yeah. They had to introduce characters. But I would have rather seen that part be shorter mm -hmm. and the night at Oxbow be longer. Or to have the conversation happening on the trail. Something happens at the beginning of the movie. Henry Fonda has too much to drink and he gets sick. He runs out the door off camera and does it. One thing I hate about modern movies and TV shows is that they insist when someone throws up that you see it. You, the viewer, yeah. see the see it spewing from their mouths. And mm -hmm. I, I hate that. It's enough to just hear them. Yeah. This might be a conversational dead end. Okay. Seven men step forward to say, spare their lives. Five of them are principal characters. And then there's two other guys. Yeah. What if one of those guys was just a nonconformist? <laughs> <laughs> he sees these people step forward. It's like, I'm going to go on that side because there's lesser of them. And then later on, he's like, holy cow, I dodged a bullet. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm an iconoclast. And then the other guy's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Is this side of the fire the pro-hanging side? Because <laughs> that's the side. Oh, well, okay. I don't want to be the guy who goes steps back across. So. <laughs> All right, and then later he's like, oh, I really <laughs> dodged a bullet. The only part of the movie that I'm really iffy about, the gun that Martinez happens to have. Oh, I just found this gun on the side of the road. It's reaching a little bit. The circumstances are, but the gun has to be there because we need more doubt. Yes. Well, maybe Martinez killed him and these other two guys don't know about it. Yeah, it's like... Or maybe well, the old man was telling the truth. We, the audience, need these seeds for it not to be such a cut-and-dry story. I want to know what Martinez has been doing up to this point in his life. I would love to see a movie just with Martinez. He goes by many names. He says he knows 10 or 12 different languages. Who is this guy? And he also has that look where you know he's done something. Yeah. He's done something that he probably should be hung for. Mm -hmm. But he's also done a lot of things he should be proud of. What of the dog? I want to know the story of that dog. I know. There was a dog at the beginning, too. It's the same dog. Oh, really? Yeah. The first time I saw the movie, as they're leaving town, I was thinking, I have that dog. Oh, there it is! <laughs> <laughs> the Oxbow incident has come to a tragic end, but our show is not over yet because now it is time for Seen It. <laughs> Seen It? Stop that. <laughs> Razzmatazz 420. Seen it? The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, a Coen Brothers film that is about how you deal with life and death. Seen it. Seen it. This is six different stories. It comes off as a Western pastiche of sorts at first, yeah. but really there is a through line. Each story is a meditation not only on death, but on ambition. So beautifully done. The storybook framing device is really well done. It seems larger than anything else that the Coen brothers have done because there's wagon trains and the wide expanses. It's odd that it's the one that went straight 
to Netflix. Yeah, it's, it, there was a limited theatrical release. The Coen brothers and Alfonso Cuaron are really ahead of the curve on this Netflix thing. Yeah. They've got these two projects. They know they can make them into great movies. They know they're not going to do big at the box office. So let's go to Netflix, who will be happy to have them. And everyone will watch them. And Netflix will put a lot of money behind them during award season because Netflix wants Oscars. Mm -hmm. It's a great example of how death can be funny. Sure. Which is something that the Coen brothers have known all along. That it's either really brutal or really funny, or sometimes both. Jorge Calvo writes, I suggest Unforgiven. Seen it. Seen it, yes. With my dad, as one should. I really like the way that this movie treats death. That it's a very serious thing. Mm -hmm. And yes. it's not to be taken lightly. To see the young hotshot take his first life, and it just destroys him. Yeah. You know, that's very affecting. Or to have someone get shot, and it takes him a long time to die. Hackman in the movie, he got his... Second Oscar for that, I believe. He's just such a real authoritarian jerk in it. Just in the matter-of-factness of his authority and how he's the good guy because he has the badge and that allows him to be the bad guy. And you get to see Richard Harris get the crap beat out of him. Oh my god, yeah. I have nothing against Richard Harris, but it's still fun to watch that. We didn't get Western crap beating out of like that until uh, Deadwood showed up, I think. Jorge Calvo also suggests High Noon. Seen it. Seen it. This movie is all about time. Time is almost a character. In yeah, there's lots of time stamps in it, just and always it, going back to that clock. And it does that really well. It's a movie of just sustained tension. They say the train's showing up at high noon, and it's 10.30 right now, and the movie's 90 minutes long. Right. So we're really seeing beat by beat the entire time of the movie. Yeah. Like Henry Fonda, you're not a fan of Gary Cooper. What well, did you think about him in this movie? Oh, well, he's he's good in it. You know, he's, he does the role right. He's right. literally good. This is a white hat versus black hat western. Mm -hmm, yes. John Wayne and Howard Hawks hated this movie, and that's why they did Rio Bravo, where it flips the narrative of the movie. The sheriff's supposed to be the guy protecting the town. The town's not supposed to protect the sheriff. Okay. So we got a bonus great movie out of it. And the uh, theme song, the theme to High Noon by Tex Ritter. High Noon! We're gonna <laughs> see the train soon! No, that's not it. It's a bit of a corny song, but it works for this story because this is a story of morality and things like that. Marcus Brisman asks, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Seen it. I remember two things about this movie. The ending, which mm -hmm. is great. And raindrops keep falling on my head, which I hate. It's a tricky sequence, that scene. <laughs> Talk about an anachronism. I forget who wrote the song. Marvin Hamlish, maybe? Uh, it sounds like a Hamlish song. But whoever sings it in the movie was not the first choice. First choice, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan <laughs> turned down Raindrops Keeps Falling on My Head, which I would love to hear Dylan singing that song. Burt Bacharach doesn't sing that, does he? I think it's a Burt Bacharach song. Is it? Yeah. Da, da, ba, dee, da, da, ba, da. Oh, That's bad for back. I can't right. stand it. You and the rest of your posse can come on over to our website, welcome to the basement show.com. All of our episodes are there, all 160 plus of them, and there are PayPal donation buttons you can click on to support this show, a one time or rolling monthly donation. People donate to this show? Alex is a donor, and he says, Here's a couple of bucks for churning the cream of YouTube. I'm a Kiwi living abroad and have been rather homesick lately. It would make my day if either Matt or Craig could give me their best Kiwi accent. It's different from Australian. Yes, it is. All right, I need to work on this. I have a New Zealand friend. The only thing I can say is Brit, present. For me, it's also how a friend of mine says the name of his son, Emmett Callum, which is Emmett Callum. To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the contents of our mail crate, we have a box so big that Craig cannot even lift it. Watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. Thank you for joining us for the Ox Bow Incident. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. And also, you should check out this. Sounds like Mustache is conducting this. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you let him alone?